Phil the Murn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this, this, this talk is now titled Feel the Murn. Um, it doesn't feel appealing for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't write it. I had my writer wrote it. Uh, so my name is Andrew Hansen. Uh, I'm a front-end engineer here at Thunder Industries. Uh, if you don't know, Thunder is a creative management platform for um, building web display ads um, without um, needing Photoshop and thousands of hours to design different sizes and uh, layouts for your display ads. Um, today we're talking about the MERN stack, which is um, MongoDB, ExpressJS, ReactJS, and Node.js. Um, you might notice that all of those um, technologies use JavaScript. Um, MongoDB is a document store, uh, NoSQL, and schemaless, what that means is it basically it, it behaves a lot like JSON essentially. You, you put JSON in, you get JSON out, you, you query it and manipulate it as such. Um, the trade off is that you don't have a schema um, without any help for libraries. Um, it's essentially key value pairs, and um, you can, whatever you put in there, uh, Mongo will take, and you can take it back out without, without any hassle. So that can be really nice if, one, you don't know what your schema looks like. Um, it's evolving really quickly, um, or you just want to be able to dump data into a spot and not have to worry about the formatting and, and model of that, that data to be correct. Um, Express is a flexible um, node framework for writing uh, node backend applications. Um, it, it provides a lot of uh, API helpers for developing your node API. Uh, it's also very popular. I think it's the most popular node um, framework out there. Um, some others might be Feather, JS, and Happy. Happy, yeah. yeah. Uh, React is a view library um, written by Facebook. Uh, it's for rendering your views on the client side, and it's what we'll be uh, writing basically most of our client side JavaScript in. Um, who here has used React before? I guess show of hands. So a lot of people never touched it before. Okay, so it's good to know, so we'll, we'll kind of give an intro to how React works. But essentially, it's a declarative library where you, you describe what you want your view to look, uh, look like based on the state of your application. Uh, I can, I'll kind of explain more of what that means in some examples. And then of course, um, our favorite um, backend library node, which uses um, Google's V8 engine, um, but it allows you to use that V8 engine on um, a client or server. So why do we want a stack like this? Um, the, it's appealing because front-end developers or developers who might only know JavaScript uh, might feel really limited uh, in the, the breadth of their, the scope of what they can really develop. And what this uh, allows us is to, is the opportunity to use our knowledge of JavaScript on the back end and to store data in a database without having to you know, learn how to do SQL queries and learn how to design a, a model. <coughs> you should still learn those things, but you don't have to. Um, it, it's, it's really nice because it's JavaScript from beginning to end, and there's no cognitive overhead, or there's no context switching of languages or paradigm, paradigm switches, and you, you can just code the same for your entire application front to back. Um, a note on MongoDB, um, it does provide a great developer experience. Everything is essentially JSON. Um, you, you can manipulate it very easily, just like you would an, uh, a JavaScript object on, on the client side, and it behaves the way you'd expect it to. But um, the fact that it's a NoSQL data store means that you don't have a, a schema that you have to adhere to. And that can be great, like for the reasons I mentioned, like um, you just want to dump data somewhere. But um, you you uh, might run into issues where one, you want uh, a relationship between two different models. You want um, to be able to uh, guarantee certain things about your data. Uh, and then also with MongoDB specifically, you run into issues at scale where um, queries can be become slow, where you have um, a lot of uh, read and writes happening uh, simultaneously. Um, there are there is a library that we'll be using called Mongoose JS, which kind of helps alleviate some of these issues. Primarily, it, it helps you describe and define schemas, 
And so when you use Mongoose to uh, store data in your MongoDB store, it will require that that data matches a certain schema. Um, it also provides some cool helper uh, wrappers for querying your data and manipulating it. Um, all that being said, on MongoDB, you don't have to use um, MongoDB on, on Node. There are some cool uh, Node drivers for PostgreSQL, uh, PostgreSQL uh, MySQL, and SQLite. Um, I don't have much experience with those, um, but they, they are more relational databases if, if that's your cup of tea and your application calls for it. Every application is different, and MongoDB might not be the best choice for you. Um, so from there, uh, we're going to get into some coding. And basically, what I want to do is kind of walk through, uh, start to finish, at a, at an accelerated pace, kind of, um, this, this tutorial that I wrote um, and put up on GitHub. Um, did everybody see this no. posted? Yeah. So I posted this a, a day or two ago. Um, it's, it's here on GitHub. Uh, it's the link. I can also send out this link again after the meetup. Thank you. Um, but essentially, it takes you from a simple index HTML, a he hello world in React, and uh, you end up at the end with um, a more, well, so that's actually not. So you, you have your client side uh, React app um, that queries for data on the server, and you have your uh, node server, which is um, actually accessing your database and processing and returning data. So um, I guess we can get started by, uh, we'll go. Should we make it a little bit bigger? A little bit bigger? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, we're doing it live, guys, so this could go terribly. Just wait for that out there. <laughs> oh, hey, I already have it, so. Okay, so step one, or step zero rather, is super straightforward where um, we have a hello world in React. So down here we have, um, a, let's start at the top actually. Uh, so we have four libraries here that we're using. Um, we have React and React DOM, which is for actually querying the DOM um, and interacting or kind of tying the DOM to your React app. Uh, we have a Babel core script here, which actually injects Babel into the, the, the browser, and the reason we want to do that is we don't, like, I'm not going to worry about a build step here. You might actually, this would probably be pulled out and you'd have Webpack, Browserify, or some other build step to bundle up yeah. your, your assets, and then you'd serve that, um, but this is just doing it in the browser. Um, and then we have Bootstrap, so you guys don't have to look at terrible, ugly HTML. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, this here is our script. This is our full application at this stage. Um, and we have uh, React DOM, which takes a React component as its first argument, which is just a function here that returns some markup. I'll explain that in just a sec. And then the second argument is basically where we want to inject the application. So I, I grab the element by its ID, and you'll see that that is right here. So our application is going to live right, right here. So this is technically um, not HTML. It is um, JSX, which is um, a X, XHTML, is that the term, uh, for um, writing jo uh, React applications without needing to uh, write out the entire function. If I were to not write this in JSX, it would look something like this, create element, I would say div, and then I would say hello, uh, I think it's a Bellevue, web dev. And so uh, when Babel gets run, it takes what I had before, it basically transpiles this guy into this guy right there. That's what Babel is doing. It's creating a JavaScript function out of my, my div tags. So it's not HTML, it gets transpiled to JavaScript. So what that means is that 
Um, your entire React application is just JavaScript. The reason we want to do the JSX tags is because they're kind of easier to digest and read and, and parse at a, at a high level. And it also, it behaves very, very much like HTML. And so if you're used to writing um, HTML templates, you'll feel right at home writing JSX. I don't think there would be anyone not using JSX. Yeah, I, I've tried actually, and there are some shorthands that are kind of nice, such as, uh, you can, a lot of people use H, create element, and then they'll say um, H div, uh, hello world. It sets a little bit better, and it, it composes okay, but I don't think it beats JSX personally. Um, so we can actually uh, open this directly in a browser, and we get a little bell web dev. Um, it's not, not very exciting, so I think uh, we'll start adding some stuff in here. I was going to code this by hand, but I think maybe I can just walk through what's going on. I think we'll get the same outcome. So we'll start off basically with what we had before, ignoring all this other stuff. So we still have this React DOM dot render. And we still have this call to uh, an, a JSX tag called app. And we're still putting it in the uh, example ID div. Uh, the difference now is that app is no longer a function. Before, we saw that app was a function. It just returned uh, some JSX. Now we've made it a class, an ES6 class. So uh, React knows how to handle functions and classes. The reason you want to use a class is because you get access to these what are called lifecycle hooks. Um, these are predefined functions that React knows about and will call in the lifecycle of your component. Uh, component will mount gets called before the component is put onto your page. It's about to be put onto your page, but it hasn't yet. So this is kind of like your, your initializer, your, maybe your constructor, but it gets called every time the component is constructed rather than every time the class is constructed. Um, and what we are doing in this um, component will mount is setting the state of the application. This is our top level um, components will have other components beneath this what, that compose our entire application. But this is where the state of our app lives. So we're building an app. I guess I can explain kind of what it looks like. Let's, do, let's see what it looks like before we go any further. So we have um, basically a list of monsters for Halloween, because Halloween is this, this, uh, this next week. So we have uh, the type of creature it is um, and the classification. So zombies are undead. Ghosts are spirits, and giant spiders are arachnids. We can add more. We can say spooky ghost and extra spectory or something. And we hit add, and it adds it to the list. So um, the entire application is essentially housed in this app component. And you can see um, when we call render, which is another uh, function that React knows about, that returns some JSX. Um, it will return these other components here that make up the rest of our application. So you can see it's very declarative where we have a monster list that makes up our monster list, and we, we pass it a list of monsters. We'll get into exactly how it, it renders each of those in a second. And then we have a create monster um, component, which makes up this guy, this guy, and this guy, this button here. So, uh, and then you can see here, this is a function that we're passing to the create monster. And when this function is called, uh, it'll call this handle add monster, which will call this function right here. So, uh, we'll dive into, we'll look at this guy first. So, monster list. is a really simple function. So this is a, a function, not a class, because it's just rendering some HTML markup or some JSX that gets turned into HTML markup. Uh, we have a, a unordered list that has a class name of list group, which is um, just bootstrap doing that, uh, giving us that class. And then we have a series of props. So this right here is our props. <coughs> if we go back down to where we actually called this monster list, 
these are our props here. So I'm passing in a prop called monsters, and the value of that prop is this dot save dot monsters. If I were to do the, the cool react dot create element, it would look something like this. So I'd say monster list, and here is an object where I can pass it um, my list of props. So this would be monsters, and the value would be this dot state dot monsters. So when Babel runs, it converts this into this right here. So you can see that the props that I'm passing in are just JavaScript objects that are given as an argument right here. So I have available props dot uh, monsters, and that, that's it. That's all. I, that's all I need. That's all monster lists. Monster list cares about. So here. Um, this tag here is another JSX thing for these curly braces. And what that means is between these curly braces, execute JavaScript. Um, whereas if I were to just say, if I were to remove these, oops, if I were to remove those, that would get rendered on my page as text that would say props.monsters.map. That's not what I want. I want to actually run JavaScript in here. And so basically I'm going to map over my, my array of monsters and I'm going to call the monster. Uh, React component. So you can see that that's just another function right here that returns um, a list tag. You can see that um, if I'm mapping over this, then this is going to return an array of monsters, right? And this will have some values, uh, this will have some other values, and that all gets uh, rendered by React as a monster um, tag kind of like this, a little bit like this, where they're just um, you know, aligned like that. And what this, if you look at the, the actual monster component, you can see that it's going to get rendered as this list tag. So I can even say that this isn't a monster, this is actually an li, right, with a, an h4 tag and a, a paragraph tag. So if we look at what the props of the monster are, we can see that we're looking for a creature and classification. So the, the props here is an object that contains a creature and it contains a classification. And uh, that gets passed in um, from the each element of this monster's array. So um, where do we get these monsters from? If we go back to our app, which again is the top the top level component, the app component here, um, we're back to this component will mount. So this lifecycle hook gets called uh, when we initialize our app, and it sets the state, the initial state of our app, to this monsters object. So there's, there's no monsters object here. It actually lives at the top level of our app. So here we have our list of monsters that are going to get rendered onto the page. And this is kind of our, our initial data store. There's, there's no Express, Node, MongoDB, any of that here. This is just uh, a React application that has an initial client side state. Um, so if we kind of go through the, the pipeline here, we were to take this first one as an example. So this is my monsters array, with the first element of that array being a zombie creature that has a classification of undead. Uh, we pass that here, or sorry, not there. Uh, right right here. So we pass that array of monsters, the first one being with the zombie. We pass that to my monster list. So now the monster list has an array of monsters, the first one being the zombie, and it, it maps through that array, and for each element in that array, it passes that, that element to the monster um, component. So then the first time, the first iteration of map is going to pass the first element of that monster's array to the monster uh, component. And so that we saw above was uh, a, an object that has uh, a creature that's a zombie with a classification of undead. So we'll, we'll return h4 tag with zombie, this will, be, this will be zombie, and a p tag which will be undead. Any questions so far? We good? Everybody follow? Yep. Don't be afraid to... I just, just want to add one thing. It's, it's, that's probably the most innovative aspect of 
React. I mean, it's it's easy to miss, but this another way to call it is functional HTML. The, the fact that the view is now a function of the model mm -hmm. is is very different from MVC, where the view is yes. almost in control of everything. Yeah. And, and that's what allows you to be very reactive because mm -hmm. what React means is that the view is replaced each time at each cycle mm -hmm. by a new version of the view. It's not the view that stays in place and orchestrates things like in MVC. It's, well, an event happens and then you recompute everything and you right. redisplay right. You know, a new instance of the view. And that's very innovative mm -hmm. you know, compared to any other framework. Yeah, so you, you, can, you can look at this independently and say, Okay, I have, a, I have a monster component here, and whatever I pass to my monster component, it's going to take the creature property and the classification property and put that and spit that out as some HTML. It's very declarative what is happening here, and it, it's very um, descriptive. Um, so we have our other component under our top level, our root component, as it were, uh, called create monster. So this, remember, makes up this guy, this guy, and this guy. So if we look at the create monster uh, function here, it's another functional component. The reason, again, that we use functions is we don't care about those lifecycle hooks. We just want to render some HTML, and it renders the same every time based on what props we give it. Um, the one difference here is that we define another function here called submit. And we'll get to what that does in just a second. But uh, if we look at what it returns, it's very similar to the other uh, components in that it's, it describes um, a container here, a div, that has an input here with a placeholder monster. And that makes up the monster input there. We have a classification input with a placeholder classification. So that, that rendered right there. And we have a button. So here, in the button, we can see that we have an on-click event handler. So that means when you click the button, uh, you have a function that you call called submit. And that function is right here. So what we do when submit is called is uh, we look at the, the input uh, and their values, which are right here. And we call on add monster, which is a prop that is passed to the create monster function. And we pass it the value of those input fields. And then we also clear out those input fields. So what is on add monster? If we go back up to our app, our root level component, um, we have uh, our create monster with an on add monster right here. And it, it has this handle monster um, down to it, which calls this function right here. So uh, we kind of very generically, very uh, rudimentarily, um, define an ID to uniquely identify that monster, and then we call this function set state, which appends that mon that new monster to um, the monster's state array. So all of our state of our application lives within this this app component under the this dot state. And um, when we call this dot set state, uh, React knows that it needs to re-render itself. Uh, this, this in a fully client-side application uh, that just uses React is how you tell re-render or you tell React that something changed. I need to propagate those changes to the DOM. So um, this gets run. This adds the new monster to the array, and then the whole uh, event loop starts over again. The, the app re-renders from the top level, and you get uh, your new state added. So we add a monster, uh, we'll refresh. So you know, you know, as we refresh, we don't save any stakes, it's all client side. If I say spooky ghost, and I say extra spectory, my uh, create monster component is gonna take the values in that input and take the value in that input. When I hit, uh, when I hit uh, add monster, it's gonna send that value back up to the top level and the top level knows how to handle that. This component here doesn't know, it doesn't care how we handle that data. It's up to the top level component to say, okay, I know I got some new values, so I need to do something with that. And that means adding it on to my monsters list and uh, re-rendering the, the, the app. So I hit that, and the whole thing re-renders. Um, we cleared out our inputs, and now we have a new uh, value in our array of monsters.
uh, any questions there? Okay. So that that kind of um, I think that covers uh, a fully client side implementation just using the R in our merge stack. So step two is we kind of want to do the same thing, um, but we want to introduce um, Express and Node. We're not going to introduce Mongo yet um, because I want to make sure we understand kind of um, where we're pulling stuff out of the client and moving it to the server without introducing the persistent storage yet. So um, if we look at our index here, you'll see that I pulled out um, my list of monsters and I moved it to my node app. We'll see that in a second. But uh, a lot of this remains largely unchanged. We have monsters list that takes uh, an array of monsters, see here, and we have a monster component which takes uh, one monster and displays creature classification. Create monster works the same. It takes the values on the inputs and sends them back up to the top. And then um, the difference here is now we're using uh, this constructor here to call to initialize our state to an empty array rather than that populated array with our um, three initial monsters. So now we have our component will mount, which says fetch using ES6 fetch uh, a route called slash monsters. Uh, when that comes back, grab the JSON off of that response and um, set the state, which is that same set state, to the data of that JSON. So again, when I call set state, that'll cause the whole thing to re-render, and our new uh, state will be whatever comes back from the server. Uh, we also have modified our handle add monster. It's the same function call, but we just changed the internals to use fetch um, to post to our, our um, express server and uh, send along our new monster. Our server is going to give us a response, and that's going to be um, the monster that's saved. And then we can then, at that point, uh, set the state by adding on the monster to our array and re-rendering using set state. And then we have our render function, which remains unchanged. So what do these routes look like? So we have post route slash monsters, and we have um, the default, which is a get route to slash monsters. So this is our, our node server using express. Um, you can see that this is the exact same array that we were using in step one. And um, this is what we're going to use as kind of a placeholder before we introduce MongoDB for persistent storage. Um, we initialize our application by calling express, <coughs> which we pulled in. And then we also want to add some configuration so that when we do receive a request from the client, we can parse that more easily. Um, what this does here is it's a, it's a really simple wrapper or middleware around the request that gives us access to the body of what our client side was asking or was, was giving us. Um, Express is really cool in that way in that it's really flexible about adding your own middlewares. So if you wanted to add um, authentication, um, you could add a middleware in here that does, you know, it, it authorizes your route so it can be accessed by certain users. Um, you can you can uh, do some pre-processing if, if you know you need some pre-processing on a set of given routes. Um, but we define our routes right here with app, which was just this guy right here, dot get. And so this is the slash monsters that we saw in our application. And all we want to do at this stage is return the, the, the list of monsters that we defined right here. So uh, the the front end is going to request that resource, and we're just going to get straight straight up give it to them, and then they can do what they what they want. Uh, and then the other route we have is a post route, which uh, reads that body, which we we get access to through um, this configuration option, and then um, it assigns an ID in the same way we were assigning an ID on the front end, and then it adds it to our data store, and um, we're going to return that monster with the new added ID. And so if we look back at uh, this guy, um, 
we can see that on our on our go. This guy. So we post it. So we send the, the JSON and express is parsing that using the, the body parser. And then it's adding an ID onto that and returning that monster back with the ID field included. And so that's what we get back right here. And then we can add that to our local state um, and it has that ID on there. So that the front end no longer needs to know or care about what that ID is. Our back end is handling that for us. So, um, you wouldn't prefer just getting the whole copy of this thing from the server? That's one way of doing it. Um, that can be really verbose. Like, um, especially when your app grows, I feel that that's a lot of data. It could be a lot of data if you're sending back. Like if we had 300 monsters, you might not, like I, I already have a copy of 299 of those monsters. Um, but yeah, but if uh, you were modifying other monsters yeah. along the way, then that would make sense maybe to to at the very least somehow inform what those other changes were. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good good point that if you want your client side to always have the freshest, the most up-to-date information, you would include as much information as, as you can. Um, so right here we have one more configuration, which is our default route. And so when we um, open our app at localhost in the browser, it's going to send this index.html file. And then um, that's going to bootstrap the application. And then the application knows that when the component mounts, it needs to fetch the initial state of the application. Um, what you can also do here in a much more production level uh, application with like server side rendering is you can, um, you might render the, the view on the server and then uh, inject the state of the application before you send it down to the client. And you, want, you might do that so that uh, the, the client is not making a request for that, that document and then making another request for the data, which you already know it's going to ask for. Um, we're not covering that here today. That, that's a pretty large can of worms to get into. And um, it, it, you really need to kind of investigate the pros and cons of the, the overhead of doing server-side rendering and injecting that, that initial state. Um, the last piece we have here is basically uh, <coughs> initializing and bootstrapping our server. You can see that we're listening to port 8080. And um, as soon as that starts up, we can, um, we can hit our server and get back an, a, an index HTML document. So if we're going to try to do that here. So I've, I've uh, included some scripts here. So we have start step two, uh, which just runs the app.js here. And what it's doing here with the node path um, is it sets the node path of the, the node server to the root level so that we get access to our node modules, which is the body parser, express, and, and mongoose. Um, if I didn't have this here, we would need to have a separate package JSON and a separate um, node modules at each in each um, folder to get that to work. So this is just kind of um, a nicety for the sake of the tutorial. Um, in a real application where you just have a single um, node app, you might uh, omit this and you get access to your uh, node modules um, that way. So you go here and we say npm run start step two and then whoa, nope, doesn't blow up. Hey, mm -hmm. we did it. So now I can go localhost 8080. And so you saw that there was uh, an initial flash of no list. That was our application bootstrapping with an empty array. We didn't have any state to, to put onto our screen. And what we were doing there is we were fetching the data from our server so that we can re-render and populate with our options here. So what's cool about this is I can um, add a new monster like uh, mummy, which is also undead. I add it there, and it adds it, right? And so what that did is it sent the request out to our Express server. Uh, the Express server added an ID onto that, and then it sent it back with the ID to our React application, which um, updated the state of the application and made the whole thing re-rendered and um, append this value to our list. And what's cool now is as long as our node server is running, 
um, we can refresh and we still have that value added on there. You, you can show your API, but you can make the call uh, like monsters. Like monsters. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah, so I'm going to go hard to read. So this is our first element array, ID of zero, not being dead. And here is the one that we created, and it's still live and kicking. Um, but if I kill my server at this point, um, we no longer have that, that array in memory. And we refresh, and now we only have the, the four. The last one is the spider, no more mummy. So that, that's no good. So we need a persistent storage solution, right? Uh, well, can go ahead. It can be, yeah. 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 <laughs> Not today. Not today, my friends. Yeah. So uh, step three, the last and most glorious step. Uh, we've reduced we've reduced our application to a very straightforward, simple uh, index HTML, where we're now requesting a static asset from our server. We're no longer embedding the entire application. Um, this is probably a, a bundled application using Webpack or something like that, and it's in some sort of a distribution um, folder. So now, um, a lot uh, has remained unchanged in our client-side app. It's just moved to a dedicated uh, JavaScript folder. Uh, you can tell that the submit has remained the same. Our React components have remained unchanged. And we're still uh, requesting data from our server. And we're posting data to our server and setting the state of our application to re-render a React app. Um, but we've added a lot more to our node server. So um, before I get into the schema stuff, uh, I wanted to point out what's remained unchanged. A lot of the Express stuff um, has, is pretty much completely unchanged. Um, we're still uh, initializing our Express app, and we're uh, configuring it to use that body parser. Um, but we've added this uh, static assets path. So if I if I make a request for these assets here, then it's gonna what it's gonna do is it's gonna look in this assets folder and return whatever the 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 folder or the file is in there. So if I ask for assets.client.js, oops, client.js, it's gonna go into the assets folder and it's gonna find client.js right here and return that to me. So we actually We'll get to that in a sec. I don't want to start quite yet. And right here, we can specify some configuration options on my static assets. This says to cache um, my static asset for 30 days so that um, the user doesn't have to keep downloading it. And uh, you, can, you can modify that however you want. You can um, configure it to have different paths last um, a different amount of days, um, and uh, so on. But besides that, the express part has remained unchanged. So we get to the mongoose, or the mongoose and MongoDB. So mongoose is a, an ODM for MongoDB that provides uh, schema declarations and some helper functions to, to parse and query your, your database. So here, um, we're going to define a schema from mongoose.schema uh, that describes what a creature and uh, classification should look like. So um, the type of a creature must be a string. If we pass it a number or something besides a string, um, we'll get a validation error. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And it's also required. So if we were to try to save a monster that doesn't have um, a creature string um, or any creature value at all, it also uh, throw, or not throw, but return a validation error. Uh, but we're, we're going to say here that we, you don't have to have a classification, um, but if you do, it has to be a string. Um, if we want to require a classification, we don't require, do require true. Um, and then we, we get a, uh, a cursor, I believe it's called, to our monster model uh, with this declaration here that says, um, this is how, this is the um, cursor I want to use to actually query my database for monsters. Um, so we go down here to configure Mongoose and connect to MongoDB. 
Uh, this just says Mongoose use uh, promises rather than uh, other promise implementations like Bluebird or Q.js. Um, and then we're going to connect to a local implementation of MongoDB. Uh, it's localhost slash merge tutorial. I, can, I could call this database whatever I want. Um, but this is, this is basically what my database is called. And uh, if I restart my app and connect to the same database, I have the same data available. Um, and then this is just saying um, you can connect, you know, make sure it's running. So the thing about this example is that you have to have MongoDB actually running locally to get anything to work. Uh, so in our previous example, you might have seen that our, our get request to monsters was just returning the array of monsters that we had stored in memory. But now it takes this cursor and says, find me all the monsters in the database. Um, if there's an error doing that, uh, return a 500 error back to the client. Um, but if it was successful and you have a list of monsters, just, just send the list of monsters. Um, and then it's kind of a similar thing with um, posting our monsters here. Uh, we want to create a new monster using the, the body, and then uh, we want to save it to the database. This does not save it to the database. Um, this, this will save it, and if there's an error, uh, tell the client as such. But if not, return the saved monster um, with its um, ID attribute. So MongoDB, uh, whenever you save a document to the data store, it will provide a unique um, ID property, which you can use to um, do more specific queries. So I could say um, monster.find is by ID. I just pass it the, uh, so it might be, um, I might say plus.params, and that, uh, ID. I could I could maybe pass an ID like this, uh, right, like that. And so what this will do, this guy right here, is it'll pass the request object a params field that I could say find find by ID. But we're just going to return all the monsters. Okay. So first thing I need to do is uh, get MongoDB running. So I have already installed MongoDB. So I'm going to call mongod to uh, get that running. And I'm going to kill this. We're going to say npm run start step three. Okay, we're connected to mongodb, and we're running on port 8080. So we go to localhost 8080. You'll notice that it's an empty right now. There's no monsters in our database. Um, we might, you know, pre-populate it at some point, but uh, say that when we you know, first start our app, we don't want any monsters in the database to begin with, so it'd be up to us to add our monsters. Say ghost, put the emoji in there. Gotta have the emoji. Inspector. Control, command, space. Yeah, control, command, space. Uh, and then we'll get um, our giant spider. So now, this also, if I refresh the page, it persists our data. And then even if I were to kill my server and restart it, you can see we connected to MongoDB, and we're still connecting to this merge tutorial database. So now that my uh, server's restarted, if I access that data, it's still there. Um, so the, oh yeah, the other thing I was going to show you was that I can access the static assets. Let me say slash assets slash find JS, and it serves me my JavaScript application. So that is kind of a basic overview of how you might write kind of a starter burn app. Um, the client side doesn't persist, like it, it, it just takes in its state from the server and renders it on the page, and sends it back to the server when it gets updated, and um, the server persists it. Um, you, could, you could do additional logic in here, so maybe when I post it, I say if, um, 
uh, uh, body dot uh, creature giant spiders uh, return be gross. Don't save it to the database, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you, you can do whatever logic in here. You might you might uh, defer to other services or controllers that do additional logic when you when you um, do a post or a get. Um, if I only wanted to let authenticated users post a new monster, I may I might have an authenticate middleware in here, and that would just be a function which um, implements my authentication. And uh, there's actually a cool library that does this called Passport. Um, it, it provides all sorts of authentication middlewares for Facebook and Google and Twitter. Uh, and it takes care of the kind of the, the hard parts of authenticating with Express middlewares. There's also a good library for JWT. Yeah, and so that there's a there's a plugin, there's a passport dot dash JWT. So if you're if you're cool and hip, you're using JSON web tokens to do your authentication and not uh, session cookies. And uh, that you would each uh, you would send um, your JWT in your request header using um, your your client side, and then you'd have your middleware parse for that that JSON web token header, and then if it recognizes it, it'll pass you along to the, the route, and if not, it'll return a 403 forbidden error automatically. Um, so that's that's all I've had formally. Um, at this time, I'd, I'd be happy to start any discussions, answer questions people might have if I can, no promises, but uh, what, uh, what do you guys think of Mern now that you've seen kind of a very simplistic implementation of it. It's good. Uh, how easy we can take advantage of for like say, React server side rendering? Uh, how easy is it? Uh, yeah. Uh, for example, currently sometimes the pages are a bit, bit complex. Yeah. And we want to get the pre-rendered from the server. Yeah. Now so that we are using, I think there is support for let's say, React uh, on doing on server side. Yeah, so, so there, there are, so actually there's something that Second up, no. um, there's a library I just saw called Next.js that supports server-side rendering. I've looked into that, and I'm not super familiar with server-side rendering, but my understanding is that actually rendering um, an HTML document on the server is pretty straightforward using React. They have um, they have a function called uh, render to string or something. It's, I think it's called render to string, and um, you could just uh, call that and send it down to the server, but the, the issue, or it's a client rather, the issue is um, what's called hydrating your state on the client side, and so you have to uh, somehow include the current state of your application yep. with that that server side render, mm -hmm. and then you have to hook up React to that, that hydration and injection of state, and that can vary wildly based on your, your state management solution. Um, here we just use set state, which can actually get you pretty far if you um, if you are sane about using it, and not using it everywhere. So um, what we did in this example is um, all the state lived at the top level component. Um, I didn't use set state anywhere else, and that's on purpose so that we know that the state of our application lives in one one spot. Um, so Redux kind of does the same thing. I think um, they do offer some some uh, hydration techniques for server-side rendering. Um, but it's very dependent on what, what you choose. Yeah, I would say in general, React is not necessarily a good fit for rendering on the server. You would render on the server for, say, SEO or... Yeah, you know, for SEO. For, for having search engine crawling your mm -hmm. important parts of your application. But if you want to build a web app, I, I wouldn't recommend using React. I think so. Um, Airbnb doesn't. That's just like one that I know off the top of my head. Um, I want to say several others do as well. Um, but it, it's really when you, it, it is a time investment, and you need to trade that off with what kind of benefits do you really get for this. And um, oftentimes it's not that much benefit. You save, mm -hmm. you shave maybe a few milliseconds or half a second on your, which can be big. That can be big, but. 
um, it, it can be inconsequential of how much you actually benefit from service set rendering. Well, I would say probably if you care a lot about mobile browsers, then it may be more relevant just to speed up the, the load time on a, on a cell phone. Yeah, sure. Um, also, if you really want to support users who have JavaScript turned off, you want to be able to have service side rendering. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, de there's definitely use cases for it, but um, there's trade-offs because it does impl implement or introduce a lot of complexity to the application. Mm -hmm. The, the other point to note is, is in React, uh, calling APIs is not easy. So, so that uh, was uh, actually a different question. Uh, it could easily be a mean stack, like I mean, you could have Angular in introduced yeah. over here. Yes. So, so uh, what was the rationale behind having just React and? Uh, some people like React better than. Uh, yeah, understand. <laughs> understand. Uh, so React, uh, so as far as how it interops with Express, I don't think there's much. Okay. Yeah, there's not much difference between how yeah. Angular or React yeah. will interact with Express it, or the mode an API application. Yeah. But um, uh, I like developing React applications because so it's more of a yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, It also doesn't have to be MongoDB. Uh, it could still be a merge stack and use MySQL. <laughs> still, <laughs> still merge. Okay. <laughs> so make of it what you want. Sure. Uh, you can make it a MFRN and use MySQL. <laughs> you know, it, it's really just one approach to doing yeah. full stack applications in JavaScript. Okay. I think the, the real draw of something like this is just being able to use JavaScript right. on front and back. Yeah. So Angular can be great for that. I, I, I've, I've used the mean stack before and it was, it was nice being able to do something a lot like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of an Angular person, so it's kind of, I'm kind of curious, kind of, how do you kind of test it? Do you use Enzyme? Right? So Enzyme is a very popular mm -hmm. uh, component testing library yeah. um, for, for your view layer. Um, what's cool about, like, I think I feel that React makes it easy to uh, separate your business logic, so like your actual processing of data yeah. from the view layer. So you test that stuff maybe with uh, you know, Mocha or Ava or something. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, you might use Enzyme to actually test the rendering of your application. Um, there's a cool feature that Jess came out with, which is the testing framework by Facebook called um, Component Snapshots. And what that does is, is it, it one word? Uh, is it one word? Component Component Snapshot. I'm not sure, but it's called. It's like taking a snapshot of mm -hmm. your component. And um, from what I understand, which is I've never used it, I've just kind of read a little bit about it, is that it it, it renders your component. And then it, it stores that somewhere, okay. and then it, it next time it runs a test, it compares that oh, output yeah. to the previous one, mm -hmm. and it says, okay, there's a mismatch. Are you cool with this match mismatch? Okay, good. We make that the new snapshot. Okay. So is this stable? Have you? Have you um, heard about I've heard a lot of really good things about it. That, that's I don't know about stability or not, but um, it, it seems really promising. Okay. I just I was just gonna start to kind of picking up the kind of React kind of from last week. This is kind of a I'm just kind of not quite sure about kind of, uh, the is it, file structure. So how does kind of uh, architecture the kind of a whole front end for React? So um, the the leading um, best practice. I don't yeah, like yeah. that word, but uh, the the leading uh, approach is you have container components and you have presentational components. The container components actually they're the ones that know how to make API calls. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that know how to you know, get business logic in there. Mm -hmm. And then they um, defer that, the results of that to a presentational component. Mm -hmm. And the presentational components are usually um, just these functions here. If they're truly presentational, they're just functions that return, return some markup or some JSX. Mm -hmm. And um, those are really easy te easily testable. Mm -hmm. um, there's no state involved. And you just pass it a series of props and you get an output. And is it, you know, is that an expected output? Okay. So, so it doesn't have to really kind of, because Angular is kind of a structure, can be really kind of a messy, really yeah. crazy. Yeah, That's so I would say that there's there's maybe th three, maybe four main c parts to a, an architecture, and that's your presentational and container, and then you'd want to put your business logic somewhere isolated to make it, you know, to isolate it and make it easily testable, mm -hmm. and then um, maybe your your API service layer would live somewhere else, and then that that kind of follows traditional um, 
the architecture models. So I know it's kind of our model model already. Yeah. Just because kind of like 2017 is coming pretty soon, so it's kind of a big off talking about the core right now, which you will kind of replace the kind of eventually express JS eventually. So, kind of do you know anything about it? Koa? Yeah. Uh, it's a it generator. Over here. Yeah, I don't. I don't know much about Koa, yeah. unfortunately. Um, I'm just happy with the express express. It's, it's, it's going to be hard for Express to go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but who knows what's going to happen. There's a lot of community support, which can be a big driver yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for uh, popularity. Did anyone use Vue.js before? Heard of it? No. V-U-E? No. Heard, yeah. of Heard of it? Use it? No. Yeah, it looks interesting. A lot of people describe it as a middle ground between React and Angular One. I don't know. I don't know how that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that holds up. Yeah, we're using Napa right now. We're kind of investigating what we want to switch to. So we play React a little bit. Yeah. And let's put you. So if you like, do you like Knockout? Yeah. So I've heard uh, a lot of comparisons between Knockout and MobX. Do you heard of MobX? No. So it's a state management library that uses observables. Okay. Um, and Knockout kind of uses. Yeah. Yeah. Applications. So people say that writing a MobX React application kind of feels like writing a Knockout application. Yeah. So if, yeah, if your developers are kind of familiar with that, that might they might latch onto that a little bit better. And also, Vue 2, 2 is just out, right? So there's a big difference between Vue 1.0 and Vue 2. Yes, yeah, they just so did a major revision of Vue.js. Same with Angular 2. Yeah. Angular yep. 2, oh man. React 2? No. <laughs> 16 actually. Yeah. React 16. They actually follow us under. I mean, so if you're um, traditionally a uh, back end yeah. developer that lives and breathes MVC, and yeah, you'll feel right at home, I think. I think that's why I like Yeah, see, that's the best problem. You might as well just say, oh, I'll put the API call here. <laughs> so I, I want to point out something um, that the API call, it lives uh, in component will mount. So that's my initialization. That's my constructor of the application before it actually renders onto the page. But you have I one. An application might have hundreds. You yeah. cannot cram a hundred API calls in, you know, with all the logic. You, know. you say API I get monsters. And so if you're using a state management library, this might say a state manager sure. dot get monsters. And so that's all the component has to care about is initializing that request. And then the state management, so somewhere else in my component, I'll say, I'll, I'll hook up my state, mm -hmm. my, my It's just a fine print, is you can't, with what you show, it doesn't scale, you can't, you can't mesh your API calls within React itself. You have to externalize the whole logic, otherwise it's unmanageable. So, but that, at that point, it's just JavaScript. You just write a JavaScript yeah, yeah. module that handles your API calls. But it took it took the React community a long time to come up with it and say, "Well, don't do that. Don't put your API calls inside the component lifecycle." I think that um, React doesn't care again how how you architect your application and outside of React itself, it's all it's just JavaScript. It's what you make of it. And um, I think people did struggle with like, oh, React is my architecture, yeah. but it's not. It's just your view layer. Yeah. And some people don't like the fact that they have to architect but, their own. But Facebook is a bit ambivalent about you know, what it is. And, you know, I, I find that they're very clear that it's just a view, a rendering library. Yeah. They're very out in front of that. Sure, that's the big title. It's just a view in MVC. You know, there's a lot of moving parts, and then you left with your choices. You look and you could end up, oh, well, I'll make a call here, and then 
you know, your, your app grows and you know, it just doesn't fit. So I'll just say that my suggestion is to put your API calls or to initialize your API calls in the mount and let let your service layer of your application handle what that means. You might pass it props if you have props, like I want to get this monster by ID of uh, three. But beyond that, it should, it's not up to React to, to take care of that. And it is not it is not set up for that. You, you can't, you know, cascade all those calls. You have a page with you know fifteen components. You're not gonna start making all the API calls. I mean, that, that's gonna be really to manage all the time. That, that's what I mean by you, you shouldn't put them here. Mm -hmm. Here you're in the app component at the mm -hmm. top level. So at the top level, that's where your logic to you know, rehydrate the state comes in. But um, it's, uh, I think for me, that if, if you're not conscious of that when you learn React, then you, you might make you know, a lot of mistakes before you, you get back into the right so Yeah. It, because React makes so few requirements, it can be easy to fall into a, a, a bad practice. Yeah. I think, I don't know, from my, from my experience, I'm more of a back-end person, more of a transaction person, and this whole thing of it's like I've never built a desktop app that ran for Windows, you know, whatever. So trying to build something that maybe this starts to mimic a desktop app and that you have so much state that it has a lot of lifetime within something very different. What were you referring to by API in general? I mean, what part of your functionality is that? Well, it's all the, the code to know it, right? You know, it exposes APIs, so in, in order to do anything interesting, your app will have to call a bunch of APIs. Oh, the client, that's when you call it the server. You're calling out of, yeah. out of the browser. Yeah. So. I guess with the client side app, state management is the biggest thing you have to do. With the desktop app, a lot of things happen because it's running in memory and stays. The state stays there. Mm -hmm. like, like with uh, client applications, there's a lot of state management that you have to have. And this frameworks, I think, help you in certain ways to manage that by enforcing certain things that you have to do in the uh, application. It is. They're stopped. And that, that, that is kind of the hard part that people on the front end complain about is manual move state. That's why there's so many different solutions for state management out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe that's why Redux uh, resonated with so many people, is that it's very uh, straightforward what it's doing. And it it simplifies the complexity in that everything is one one place. But then um, what I found is that it also introduces more complexity in how you query and update that data. Not not complexity in what is my app doing, but complexity in I have to do all these things in order to update my app to be where I want it to be. But the, the trade-off is that I know where it's gonna be. It's a very, very powerful thing. So what is the Redux and Flux doing exactly? What is Redux doing? Yeah, right. So Redux itself, um, the library on its own, uh, the author came out and said this, that if you were to take away kind of the, the safeties and error checking and invariance, it would be like 100 lines of code. So it's doing very little without the error checking in there. And um, what it's doing is it's uh, taking in a... Uh, in action and calling what are called reducers mm -hmm. and updating your state object tree based on the results of that reducer. You can show it here. In other words, the, the handle monster here. Instead of calling the API, it would go into Redux. And Redux will decide what to do. Yeah. So just call the API. And then once once the API returns, then you say this set state and React will give you that, that state. So in other words, you, the React is only used for the view. Mm -hmm. All the events are wired into Redux. Right? 
all those uh, methods like handle app monster or whatever actions you have in your app, they will all go to Redux. Oh, Redux okay. does its thing, and Redux returns you the whole state. Oh, okay. And then you bring it back, and mm -hmm. React does its thing and renders it. So, in production, how do you use a Redux? Is just kind of a install the Redux library and then you just yep. it there's an NPM package. Oh, so it's kind of, I mean, but it's kind of Redux does something when mm -hmm. you call this kind of Redux, so how do you call it? I think the question was whether it's a client side framework or a server side framework. Mm -hmm. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. It's generally client side, it's but yeah, it, can be, side. it can be used um, server side as well. Oh, okay. It's pure JavaScript, yeah. so it's, oh. it's, it's not, it's not um, affiliated to React itself. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's kind of about coming, if we go further, deeper, this React thing is kind of a, in Angular we use a money queue for the uh, promise. So how do you use it? Do you guys have the promise? So actually, um, it's using ES6 promises here. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we, instead of dollar queue, um, I, I mean, I, for this application, I use just the promise mm -hmm. implementation. Um, but you could also use the, the queue library, which dollar queue is very heavily based on, or yeah. maybe, maybe the other way around. Um, so it's a, in the package, not the kind of uh, have to install another library. Uh, so if you're if you're fully ES6, then yeah. you can use the Promise specification. Uh -huh. It's it's pure JavaScript at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have to support legacy browsers, you need to either transpile that those promises, mm -hmm. or include a library like Q or something it's else. A Q library. Yeah, there's a Q library. Mm 